Hi, John. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Doing very well. Good, good. Want me to introduce us? Please introduce us. I am Robert Wright of Blowing Heads TV. You are Jonathan Haidt, noted psychologist and author. Uh, you're, you're a professor at University of Virginia. I think now you may be on loan to the NYU Business School. Is that right? That's correct. I'm spending the year at NYU Stern mm -hmm. uh, so that I can be in New York uh, to promote the book and basically so that I can be in New York. Good timing. Good timing. You leave nothing to chance. You, you, you thought the, uh, the Charlottesville media infrastructure wasn't quite enough to accommodate a book such as this. So this is the book. You are also the, the author of uh, The Happiness Hypothesis, but this is The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Here is the actual division. Uh, as far as the type, you're going to have to take my word for it that it exists. Here you can kind of see it. But a, <laughs> but a funny thing about this is that it's perfectly visible in the flesh, but you got to get the exposure exactly right to see it on camera, I think. Anyway, there's words here, trust me, and there's a division. Um, and it, it's a bestseller, right? Uh, yes, it uh, debuted at number six on the New York Times bestseller list. Wow, how much better can it get? The answer is number one, but still, the uh, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah, it's almost as though there's an audience for it. It's almost as though Americans are trying to figure out what the hell is happening to our country. You think that's it? Because there's actually several angles you can seize on in this book. Like your, your TED talk is very spiritual and uplifting and not, and not very political. But, but, but the, the, the subtitle suggests you want to focus on what you've learned about the, the, the differing ways that liberals and conservatives tend to make moral judgments. Well, I would say what I want to focus on is moral psychology. And if I can teach, uh, teach the world a little bit of moral psychology, uh, then it's easy to see what is politics. Politics is a very direct outgrowth of our tribal, groupish, moralistic, moral psychology. And religion is an outgrowth of our tribal, groupish, moralistic, moral psychology. In both cases, we make something sacred, we circle around it, and we're then able to trust each other and fight the other team. So I want to talk about moral psychology. And right now, in 2012, Everybody wants to interview me about politics. Okay. Well, let's talk about a little of each. There is a connection. Mm -hmm. um, let's um, go through some of the kind of basic points you make. And, and the one we'll, we'll, we'll begin with is actually one that was central to your previous book, The Happiness Hypothesis, which is just the idea that although we think of ourselves as making all, the, all of our decisions at a conscious level, uh, much or even most of the action actually happens at an unconscious level and is not so much about reasoning as about emotional reaction to things. That's right, exactly. So the analogy that I used in the happiness hypothesis is that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict, like a small rider on a large elephant. Mm -hmm. And the rider is our conscious reasoning, uh, which uh, is a very new development evolutionarily, in the last uh, uh, half million years probably. Uh, and uh, the elephant is the other 99% of the mind, uh, uh, automatic processes that run other animals' minds just great. Um, so we're able to have uh, uh, conflicts, of, uh, uh, conflicts of the will, weakness of will. Um, we, uh, we see this especially in uh, moral and political arguments. Um, uh, we, we try to engage with other people, we think with reasoning, but damn it, they all seem to be just stuck on one position and impervious to reason. It's as though they were emotionally committed to some position. Mm -hmm. And our words fall on deaf ears. Okay. And it not infrequently happens, I gather, that, that what's happening at the conscious level is we're trying to justify, in terms that others will accept, um, a, a more intuitive reaction um, mm -hmm. that may, not necessarily always, but may be actually self-serving. <laughs> Just occasionally. Just so, occasionally. For, you know, I, I imagine a lot of your audience is familiar with these uh, highlights from... Uh, behavioral science research from the last 30 years. Um, number one, Mike Gazzaniga finds that split brain patients are able, one half of the brain is able to justify something that it sees the other half doing. It has no access to why, but it makes up a story just the same. In the 1980s, uh, Gazzaniga calls, the, calls conscious reasoning uh, the interpreter module. Um, so I'm on board with him. Uh, early 1990s, John Barge uh, describes, uh, sort of sets off the autom automaticity revolution in social psychology, showing how even higher conscious processes, higher cognitive processes, are often done uh, very intuitively and automatically. Uh, Tim Wilson writes the book Strangers to Ourselves. Malcolm Gladwell writes the book Blink. 
So all these, you know, everybody's talking about the same thing. Basically, most of cognition is automatic and unconscious. Okay, so you could have called your, well, you might have been tempted to call your book The Self-Righteous Mind. Yeah, that was just a little clunkier. Uh, when I looked up <laughs> in the dictionary and read about the origins of the word righteous, uh, it doesn't really mean self-righteous. It actually means virtuous and just. Exactly. But it has such kind of, it's, it's got a kind of a biblical feel to it. Uh, righteous, we don't use that right. very often. Um, in fact, when I Googled to see if I could call it the righteous mind, the only times I ever heard that were a few church sermons that had used the phrase righteous mind. Um, so that's what I wanted. I wanted the feel of that this isn't just a straight, straight descriptive, we have moral minds. I mm -hmm. wanted to really convey the sense that we are self-righteous, hypocritical sons of bitches who can actually get along pretty well under most circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. Although there is this other side of your book, uh, which is... Um, somewhat in tension with that, not not in the sense that they bet you know, not in the sense of irreconcilable tension, but you are emphasizing group selection more than some evolutionary psychologists, and as a result, are depicting people as more frequently selfless than some uh, than some psychologists might. Right. So that's why I mean, I, I actually. I didn't take the, the the title "The Righteous Mind" to just be a more concise way of saying the self-righteous mind. I think that actually captures some of uh, the book and some of what you're emphasizing in talking about the book, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the two perspectives are not at all in tension, or rather, what I should say is um, they are in exactly the sort of tension you would expect from creatures designed by multi-level selection. Uh, we can get into that now. We can get into it later, but we should certainly get into it. Yeah, let's let, let's hold off a little just yeah. to get to the explicitly political part of your sure. thesis. Okay, so in terms of the unconscious uh, reactions to things that uh, that inform our moral judgments, and that that we you know the judgments that we then try to articulate uh, in a conscious way and justify in a conscious way. Um, You've done some survey work that leads you to kind of break, uh, break our, our moral reactions down to the what you call foundations, right? That's right. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you, I mean, quickly I'll say that that, that some of the foundations are, uh, you know, one is care as opposed to harm. In other words, most people think that under many circumstances it's it's good to care for things and not to harm them. Um, another one is liberty versus oppression. People people. Generally, you know, all other things being equal, like liberty, there, there's fairness versus cheating, uh, loyalty versus betrayal, authority versus subversion, sanctity versus degradation. So, um, you you surveyed you uh, online surveys covering a lot of people, and you mm -hmm. asked them to 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 say yes or no to to, to di agree or disagree with statements like one of the worst things a person can do is to hurt a defenseless animal. That would capture their position on the care harm uh, spectrum, um, and so tell us what you found in terms of. Then you then you correlated the answers with ideology, political mm -hmm. ideology, right. and and what did you find? Uh, right. Well, first I, I want to really get people to think in the right way about this because I find people who who hear the theory often think that I'm saying it's like these are the these are the sort of the um, you know, buttons, the actual buttons that, that we're pressing when we make moral judgments. The theory is really a theory of, of, of development and cultural development. That is, um, you know, for a long time now, people have made the, metaphor, the, the analogy to language. Morality is like language. You know, it varies around the world, but it also has a lot of consistency. Mm -hmm. I think a better analogy is to taste. And if you think about the taste buds, or rather the taste receptors, there are five different kinds of taste receptors on the tongue. Um, and when we eat a meal, it's not just, I mean, we, it's not just, oh, salt, oh, sweet. Um, we, we eat a meal which is cooked in accord with a cuisine. Cuisines are cultural constructions. Uh, but we all, all over the world, we all have the same tongues. And these tongues tell us about human evolution. If you look, well, we've got a sweet receptor and a sour receptor. We must be fructivores. We, were, we ate fruit for a long time. Is it ripe? Is it not ripe? Um, you know, we do uh, salt and glutamate. We must have been meat eaters. So... Our evolutionary history gave us these tongues, and then cultures build cuisines on top of those taste buds. Same thing for morality. Um, all over the world, this is what really got me when I was uh, studying cultural psychology with Richard Schwader, and I was reading all these uh, uh, ethnographies. It's like, wow, the specific practices vary so much, but, you know, the logic of purity and pollution is amazingly similar. 
all over the world around initiation rites, menstruation, handling corpses. So uh, that's the idea here, is to identify from looking both at ethnographies and at evolutionary psychology. And what are the bridges? I, I was committed to not just making up my own evolutionary story, saying, oh, well, all over the world, people value X, so how could, you know, could we tell a story? Of course we can tell a story. I wanted to take things off the shelf, like reciprocal altruism, coalitional psychology, hierarchy. Um, so I wanted to take those things you know, that were already there and make connections. So that's what the, 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 the well, now six foundations are, are all about. Um, so they were posited based on that kind of review, and then they were tested. It was originally a theory to study how cultures differ, how nations and cultures differ. It was never intended to apply to politics. Um, but then, as I worked with the theory in the 90s, and the, the culture war got sort of you know, worse and worse, and um, I began looking at the differences between liberals and conservatives as though they were separate cultures. Okay, so <clears throat> everyone responds to some extent to to all of all of these. I mean, I mean, for the most part, people in general respond to some extent, and and any given world judgment may involve uh, invoking more than one of them. Mm -hmm. But but you found that the extent to which uh, liberals and conservatives draw on 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 these these different uh, you know dimensions of kind of uh, moral reaction was was different. And, and let me That's let me right. sh let me show a a, a graph okay. here. Um, okay, so I don't know if people can see, but these are very liberal people over here, very conservative people over here. You won't be able to make out these lines, but the bottom line. Uh, the bottom three lines are the loyalty, authority, and sanctity dimensions, and as you can see, they they don't they don't count a, a, nearly as much for liberals as they do for conservatives. Indeed, for those lines slope upwards. Right. So for conservatives, the five dimensions are, in some sense, uh, you know, almost drawn on about equal or given about equal weight, you might say, whereas liberals. And this is, uh, in this particular study, the two kind of liberal dimensions that liberals are emphasizing are care on the one hand and fairness on the other. I know your typology kind of got refined a little, but, uh, but, but, but that, that illustrates the basic, the basic nature of your finding, that kind of discrepancy across the ideological spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, the, so the, the take home message is that liberals tend to build their moral cuisine, as it were, on two or three taste buds, care, uh, fairness, and li we later added liberty. Obviously, liberals are very concerned about fair, uh, liberty versus oppression of, of certain groups. Um, so liberals have, you could say, a, you know, they use three, three taste buds primarily, but they really rely on one above all, which is care. Liberals are extremely sensitive about care, victimization, suffering. Um, conservatives use all six. They value all six. And so the culture war, the older culture war before the Tea Party, the older culture war, you remember uh, such issues as flag burning and uh, abortion and birth control? Can you imagine we used to argue about birth control? Oh, yeah, right. That one's back. But um, that culture war is over people who, you know, secular humanists and uh, liberals who are generally materialists, who don't believe that there is some sacred untouchable essence, and who think that we should manipulate the world for the benefit of people. And if that's your view, you can't understand what could possibly be wrong about Therapeutic uh, cloning and stem cell research and uh, uh, voluntary euthanasia it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But most people, most Americans certainly, um, want to live in a world that is much more ordered and structured. Uh, social order and structure and hierarchy, groups, coalitions, the nation, patriotism, and a sense that, that we are children of God and the body is a temple, those sorts of issues. Uh, so uh, what I've found repeatedly with my colleagues at yourmorals.org um, and this was a theory developed with, with Jesse Graham and uh, um, uh, Craig Joseph originally, and now with the rest of the gang at Your Morals. What we found using many methods is that liberals focus on care especially, and then also some fairness and liberty, uh, but conservatives use all six. Okay, and, and you think that this gives uh, conservatives a kind of, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but a kind of uh, strategic or tactical advantage in, in the sense that they understand uh, better the valence of all these dimensions mm -hmm. than liberals do. I guess, in theory, liberals, when, when they see, they, they don't appreciate how strongly someone might uh, respond to, say, the authority dimension or the loyalty dimension 
because they're just not that sensitive to that. Whereas you're saying conservatives are about equally sensitive to all of them. Mm -hmm. And, and in, it, so, so are you saying that that in, in a sense that in a sense, conservatives understand liberals better than liberals understand conservatives? That's exactly what I'm saying. We've got the data to back it up. Uh, in a study done with Jesse Graham and Brian Nozick, we found that uh, when we had uh, people fill out our Moral Foundations questionnaire, either as themselves or pretending to be a, a typical liberal or pretending to be a typical conservative, uh, moderates and conservatives could do all those three pretty accurately. They tended to, their, their guesses matched what the actual people of that group said. The only people who were really inaccurate were people who said they were very liberal. When they're trying to pretend that they're a conservative and they're asked things like justice is, a, uh, is an important virtue, they say, no, conservatives don't think justice is a virtue. How could they? They believe in you know, this policy and that policy. They hate justice. They, you know, so, um, so basically think about it like this. You know, we have those three, you know, three color receptors in our eyes. Was it red, yellow? Uh, we have three pairs of, we have various color receptors in our eyes. We don't have infrared receptors or ultraviolet receptors. Now, those might not be very useful in the world. Maybe the three we have are the most useful. Um, but a person who has those receptors doesn't have any trouble understanding how a person without them sees the world. But if you and I try to imagine, what would it be like to see an infrared light? We can't do it. All we can say is, well, I bet it's really, really red, but it's probably a lot more than that. And if, if you lack the receptors, or rather you just don't have the sensitivity, you end up doing some kind of dumb things. Like you end up endorsing laws that give teenagers the right to find an abortion provider without telling their parents. Because you reason, well, you know, we don't want them, what if their parents say no? You know, we don't want them to be victims. And I can't think of a better way to piss off conservative parents than to tell them, I once heard a conservative woman say, I would never let my daughter pick her own orthodontist, never. But the liberals tell me I'm supposed to let her pick her own abortionist? So if you don't understand the importance of parental authority and you just make laws based on what you think is gonna be good for the victims, you can really uh, you know, put your foot in it as it were. And the Obama administration did that in January. Of course, it could be that they actually believe in the policy and they're not just shaping, tailoring their views to what they think they can get sneak past the other side, but uh, okay, well, that, well, right. There's the, there's the strategic consideration, which is certainly something that I think the Democrats should take account of. But then there's also the, the, the normative consideration. Which side is really right? That's a much trickier issue for us to get into. But the conclusion I came to in writing the book and in trying to understand liberalism and conservatism as alternate forms of creating a society in which people can flourish, that is, in a sense, I'm a utilitarian, as it were. I'm a sort of a broad utilitarianism all in. I think actually conservatives do a better job of it. Um, they understand the need for social structure, for institutions, uh, for traditions. And the proof of this, not knockdown proof, but I think it's, you gotta take it as the first order proof is that conservatives are happier than liberals and religious people are happier than, than atheists. Well, but I'm not sure. Uh, wait, you're saying conservative positions are more conducive to a society that will maximize welfare? Well, that's the hypothesis that some conservative intellectuals that I've been reading put forth. It's one that I never encountered until I was in my 40s. I always thought conservatism just meant you believe in God and you want Christian Sharia, but that's not really. So these are utilitarian conservatives then? Exactly, exactly. And but, but it sounds like you're saying they're right, that yes, their policies show a deeper comprehension of human nature, and if their policies flourish, then people will be happier. Well, right. I, I'm not saying that they are definitely right. What I'm saying is that is the argument they make. Mm -hmm. It is an empirical question. It's very hard to resolve. It's not one for which there will be a single knockdown piece of data. But after having written the happiness hypothesis and come to the conclusion that happiness comes from between, it comes from being embedded, after falling in love with Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist who was himself a liberal, but came to see the importance of both constraint, authority, tradition, various forces that bind people in, perhaps they would not even choose to be bound in, but they end up being better off for it. So basically, I'm a Durkheimian. I believe that Emil Durkheim basically understood the nature of society. And if you're a Durkheimian, you're going to be very skeptical of a kind of a far left view, which says, imagine there is no nations. It isn't hard to do. Nothing, or no, what is it? Imagine there's no, no religions. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no, whatever the, you all know the lyrics. And no, and no, yeah. And no religions too. Imagine so, yeah, I think imagine there's no heaven, blah, and then what you said. But anyway, whatever. Um, the the so, uh, so that's the hypothesis. I'm not saying that conservatives are definitely right that their formula leads to better flourishing. But I'm saying what I know about moral psychology, Durkheim, and happiness 
leads me to be very interested in their ideas. And I think they might be right. Well, OK, but I mean, it's not as if. I mean, you're saying it's it's you're acting as if it violates human nature to extend brotherhood beyond the scope of the nation. But it's not as if the nation is a natural compass. You know, our evolutionary context was not nation states. We're not designed by natural selection to to feel a sense of kinship with 300 million people. It is it is through, uh, you know, it, it, it's through a kind of a cultural adaptation that that we make that connection. Right. I mean. So I don't. That's a great question. And, and so let's talk about that. Um, clearly, we evolved. You know, you and I are both very much on the same page, you know, materialist evolutionary approach to human nature and religion. Um, the, so one of the most influential things I've read while writing the book is, is uh, uh, the book Not by Genes Alone by uh, Pete Richardson and Rob Boyd. And they talk a lot about the tribal instincts hypothesis that we evolved to have tribal instincts. And this is the big idea in my book, really, is. Um, morality binds and blinds. We're very good at binding ourselves into communities. And the great breakthrough was when we were able to go beyond kinship and scale up to groups so large that all they, that they were just bound together by uh, tribal markers, such as uh, forms, of ad forms of clothing, address, hairstyle. Um, they could get quite large in that way. And I think a nation state is actually the largest unit we can do for which our tribal instincts still work. Now, well, you're talking about a number of people that is the max, 300 million is the no. max, or geographic scope? Or are you no. just saying that there has to be some other group that we are opposed to? Well, it's not necessarily opposed to, but we have to be a part of, part of a group that has an identity and has a quasi-religious nature to it. This is the thing that I think the left often doesn't get, the secular left doesn't get. Politics is much more like religion than it is like shopping. And, you know, you and I spent that year at Princeton, or you're at Princeton, so, you know, we, we taught that, that class together. Uh, I was part of that seminar group. You got a lot of smart people thinking about politics and thinking about nation states. There was one scene, uh, I don't know if you're at the seminar, but it was a guy from, from Harvard Kennedy School saying, you know, nation states are these ridiculous things. Someone puts up a sign that says, this is our border, and, you know, you, the rest of you keep out. And so they're just arbitrary contrivances. That's the John Lennon view. And I think it's just flat out wrong. The, relig the nation, uh, you know, there's a work by Robert Bella. Um, the, there's an American civic religion, and the president is the high priest. And we have patriotic songs. We have our origin myths. We distort our history, all those things. There's not a numerical limit, but a nation is the largest unit that does all the stuff that activates the tribal mind. I think the left often wants to scale everything up to the United Nations and the Brotherhood of Man. And that but I mean, it, it wasn't always like that. I mean, you know, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, France was mm -hmm. not France. And, and, the, and, the, and the levels of loyalty were at a, were, were, loyalty was resided at a lower level of organization. So I, I don't understand why you think things can't change. OK, because so, you know, there's that Arab proverb, me against my brother, me and my brother. Well, against that gets, yeah, that, that was my question. Are you saying there has to be an opposing group? That, that, that would make sense to me if that's what you're saying. Yes, there has to be another group. You don't have to be at war with them. But yes, there have to be other groups. Correct. OK, so you're not. So, so then you're not saying so much that the nation state per se is the limit as there can't be one planetary unit that commands the kind of loyalty you see in a nation Until state. barring invaders plants. from Mars. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. You got it. OK, we, we, we got through that. I mean, the, the, before we leave this, the other the other thing I'd ask about conservatism is this. You're depicting it as very commu uh, communitarian, um, whereas, you know, some would argue, no, well, liberal. Right word. Some branches are, but that's not the that was not the word I would well, use. Well, it's their emphasis on their appreciation of community that you're that, that, that you're applauding. Right. For the social conservatives and for the religious right, for the Christians, yes, communitarian or that sort of stuff would be word. Communitarian is a word that both sides can claim. Okay. Um, well, then I will not uh, pursue that further. Anyway, um, what? Uh, well, but quickly before before we leave we leave politics, I guess a couple of little things uh, in this context. One is you're saying. Not that conservatives and liberals are separate species, but right. but you do you do right. I mean, in terms of their separate being tribes. OK, OK. But I'm, what I'm talking about is the possibility of a genetic difference. You write people whose genes give, gave them brains that get a special pleasure from novelty, variety and diversity. 
while simultaneously being less sensitive to signs of threat, are predisposed, but not predestined, to become liberals. So you're suggesting there is some correlation with genes. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's clear. Look, everything, every aspect of personality is heritable. And there are a couple of amazing findings from the Genetics and the Genome Project that are just shaking everything up. So the first one from the 80s was that everything is heritable, and whether you're liberal or conservative is as heritable as everything else. Mm -hmm. Second, everything is heritable between 30 to 50 percent of the variance, typically. 30, you know, sometimes a little less, but 30 to 50 percent of the variance on almost all traits turns out to be uh, due to the genes. Third, there ain't no genes for anything. Nobody is, the Genome Project has been a flop if the goal was to find genes for disease, genes for personality. So no one can find a gene uh, that does much of anything, yet somehow all the genes together as a total pattern gives you a brain similar to identical twins, so that if you're separated at birth and you're raised in different households, but you've got a temperament predisposed to liberalism, odds are when you go off to college, you'll both probably gravitate towards the kinds of groups and people, and not necessarily. But I'm just saying there is some sort of a genetic basis that, to personality, and personality makes certain ideas more congenial to some people rather than others. Mm -hmm. And one of the personality traits uh, with an ideological uh, correlate is conscientiousness. You're, you're, right. Conservatives are more conscientious, you say. But exactly, yes. exactly what does that mean in the context of, of personality psychology? I think that's a word that's not, it isn't exactly its lay usage that, that personality psychologists right. are invoking, mm -hmm. right? Right. Well, conscientiousness, we mean one of the big five traits, you know, agreeableness, neuroticism, those things. Um, and it's not too far from the common sense usage of it. Some people just feel the pull of obligations, rules, laws, traditions, procedures. And you can see, you know, look, most stereotypes have a basis in truth. So imagine that you were part of a, imagine you are teaching on the faculty of an art school versus you're uh, at, a, at a, you know, a Catholic university. Uh, where do you think the meetings are going to start on time? And where can you just expect everything's going to be 5, 10, 15 minutes late? You know, I mean, stereotypes have a basis in fact. Um, in the military, one of my grad students was a Marine. Um, uh, on time means five minutes early. Um, there are just, there are differences in how brains work. You know, it's funny. I, I was once at a libertarian conference. What's it called? The, is it the Liberty Fund or something? It was in one of these, I was in Montana. And there was a, a non-huge honorarium. But they were explicit that if you were late, there were many sessions each day, and if you were late for a session, you would, like, surrender your honorarium or something. I mean, it was like, uh, and, and you're well, saying that's... Libertarian, li libertarians go both ways. I mean, libertarians are not liberal. They're not conservative. They are really unique. I've got really great data on that if you want to talk about it. Um, but libertarians are the most, they're the smartest, most rational, and most consistent people out there. They're also not, they're also sort of the least sociable. Uh, it's often said that getting libertarians to work together is like herding cats. My guess is if you were at a libertarian organization that worked together as libertarians, they were probably more conservative libertarians than left-leaning libertarians. Well, but maybe the fact that they had to provide an incentive suggests that, that no, they weren't, that, that it was a mixed group and the conservative was in charge and laying down the law and okay. the whatever. That could be. Um, but, uh, okay, so you, you say, okay, again, your, 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 your metaphor is this idea that the unconscious mind is the elephant, the conscious mind is this rider trying hard to keep the elephant more or less in line. And so these, these uh, kind of affective reactions, these, these moral foundations that undergird our, our, our moral judgments are in the elephant part. Mm -hmm. Right. And you write, if you want to change someone's mind about a moral or political issue, Talk to the elephant first. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's so right. what, what's an example? I mean, I guess especially if liberals are, are the ones who are wor worse at this. Is that is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, well, how do, how do you talk to the elephant? Right. So, so here's what you should not do. Um, uh, if you know that a person doesn't like you or doesn't like the position you're arguing for, if you know that you're starting off uh, looking at things differently, and you think, well, let me just lay out the reasons why he's wrong. Okay, that's generally not going to get you very far. That's Ryder talking to Ryder. Mm -hmm. That's like having the press secretary for Obama arguing with the press secretary for John Boehner. It's, it is not possible. There is no set of words that could ever be said that will change either one's mind. That's just not the way their jobs are set up. Um, talk to the elephant first means rather than jumping into the argument, you arrange it so that you're going to go for a walk or maybe go uh, have a meal together. You talk about people you know in common. Uh, you develop a little bit of rapport, a bit of a relationship, 
And then when you do get around to business, you might start by saying, you know, I know we disagree on this. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I, as I see it, your main concern is this, you know, you're really concerned that if we, if we do this law, if we go with this policy, this is going to be a threat to family stability. You know, I, I see that point and I agree with you. And that's why I'm concerned, you know, so you start by, and this is just straight Dale Carnegie. You start by assuring them that you actually recognize what they're most concerned about. You don't think they're crazy or stupid. And if you do that, that's talking to the elephant. Now, they're actually going to want to make a reciprocal concession. And they might be willing to say, well, yeah, you know, you're right. And thank you for that. And I can see why you're actually, you know, so you, you can do indirect methods um, that will get the other person off of battle stations and into the normal human agreeableness in which we're pretty good at looking for common interests, common ground. You know, we don't agree on everything, but actually we can agree to do this and that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Are you really talking to the elephant? I, I mean, in other words, yes. uh, can't, you're can't... being you're, you're going around the central line of logical arguments directed at the person's position. But it just seems to me that approach would work if if in stressing your your understanding of their concerns, you talked about concerns they've actually expressed, articulated. Right. That, in other words, that their that their press agent has. Much. I mean, that, that Dale Carnegie approach would work. Right. Oh, no, that's right. That's exactly what it is. And they're usually pretty vocal about it. I mean, uh, you know, Rick Santorum uh, and you know, social conservatives have been saying what they think for decades. It's, it's a matter of public record. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, for example, on a lot of social policies, they have been they've been really concerned about the decline of the family uh, for decades and decades. Um, and what has the response been on the left? The response is, well, you know, um, there are all kinds of families are equally good. And we can't criticize single mother families because, you know, lots of people that we cherish and value have single parent families. So we can't criticize that. And decade after decade goes by and the illegitimacy rate goes up and up and up, not just for African-Americans, but now for white people. Now, here we are 30, uh, what is it, 40 years after the Moynihan report on the decline of the black family. And finally, the front page of The New York Times, uh, you know, it was uh, about uh, two months ago, a gigantic article, several pages long chronicling what happens when now it, you know, the, the illegitimacy rate for white people as well, for all groups other than college educated, for all non-college educated groups, the illegitimacy rate is so huge and this leads to so many problems. So finally, 30, 40 years later, the, the left is actually able to open its eyes and say, hmm, maybe raising children without a father or an, it's fine with me if it's two gay people, that's totally fine. But maybe raising people with a single parent is not so good. But he, he, I mean, here what you're saying is, is liberals, you're not telling them how to sell their policies. You're saying they should adopt the policies of conservatives. In this case. Well, what I'm saying is you can acknowledge where they were right. If so if what matters to liberals on marriage has mostly been, recently in recent years, it's mostly been gay people. That's the issue. That's why they care about marriage. That's why they that's one of the reasons they can't say that marriage is good. They haven't been able to say that it is necessary for a long time. But if that's what you care about, you can say, you know what? You're right about how important it is to have people bound together to raise a child. You're right about that. We want gay people to be able to do that, too. Well, I, I, I don't think that's all it is, though. I mean, I, I think also they want um, women. You know, there are some women in the in the coalition who would like to feel that they could have a child whether or not they buy into what they see as the, you know, conventional, um, you know, leave it to beaver scenario. Um, I think there's also, and this may get back to the care dimension. I don't know whether it does or not, but I think there's also the feeling, look, there are a lot of people in this position, whether fortunate or not, and we don't want to stigmatize them. So, I mean, a lot of that's things. Right, exactly. That's right. That's the problem. If you, so, so the, the fundamental rule of political analysis from the, from the point of view of moral psychology is follow the sacredness and around it you will find a ring of motivated ignorance. So if you sacralize women, African Americans, gay people, if you sacralize groups that really are victims, I'm not saying don't fight for their rights, but I'm saying once you say this is what our coalition is about, is fighting for these victim groups, then around that you've got a ring of denial and motivated ignorance. So for example, you know, is it good and necessary and helpful to have a father around or at least a second parent? Um, well, you know, I, I did some research in Brazil with street kids. And one of the things I learned is that the most dangerous person in the world is mom's boyfriend. If you're raising kids and a, a woman is not married and there's a succession of men coming uh, through the house, a very large number of girls are going to get raped. Well, 
Yeah. I mean, in general, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson in evolutionary psychology yeah. long ago documented uh, the, the, the downside of, of non-biological fathers. Exactly. Uh, not, not that there aren't a lot of good ones. Right. That's but, right. But so, right. So, so, so you're right. The, the people, the people on the left are very concerned about stigmatizing anyone. And that means they're going to then deny the evidence. They don't want to know the evidence about what's good for children because that might, might lead to them stigmatizing some people. But of course, conservatives sacralize things. Conservatives oh, yeah. sacralize tax cuts, you know. Well, uh, they sacralize God and the nation. And you're right. Nowadays, they are sacralizing tax cuts, which is a weird thing to do. And so perfect example. Follow the sacredness. The Republican, let me say first, everything I'm saying, any good thing I'm saying about conservatives, do not transfer to the Republican Party. I have a lot of good things to say about conservative intellectuals. I have very little to, good to say about the Republican Party. The Republican Party is in this weird moralistic spiral in which, and I think this really is kind of a trick. They have gotten all this rhetoric about tax cuts for the rich being good for, you know, job creation, all that stuff. It's not true as far as I can tell. And they're getting everybody to circle around this and, and defend it so that now they're even saying not just no new taxes, but no new revenue. And this is bizarre and really destructive to the nation. So please, you know, nobody in the audience here should think I'm defending the Republican Party. OK, so let's move uh, into the more uh, some of the more theoretical parts of the book. OK, you, you talked about religion. And we alluded a little bit to group selection. Mm -hmm. uh, by group selection, we mean, crudely speaking, the idea that some things evolve, quote, for the good of the group. That's misleading, but it'll do, I guess, uh, until we revise it. Um, you emphasize that more than some, uh, some <clears throat> Darwinians. And in particular, uh, you apply it to religion and argue that religion is to some extent in the genes as a as a result of group selection right mm -hmm. right so let's let's revise that right away what you said it's not see everybody's been looking at it as though it's for the good of the group and then they focus on altruism um i think the contrast we need to make here is between selfish and groupish so uh i'll just read one little passage here um, when I say that human nature is selfish, I mean that our minds contain a variety of mental mechanisms that make us adept at promoting our own interests in competition with our peers. That's straight. Everybody agrees with that. Your, your book, Your Moral Animal, is all about that, how incredibly good we are at pursuing our self-interest, even in our friendships, things like that. So everyone agrees with that. We're shaped by the competition of individual versus individual within groups. Fine. When I say that human nature is also groupish, I mean that our minds contain a variety of mental mechanisms that make us adept at promoting our group's interest in competition with other groups. We are not saints, but we are sometimes good team players. Right. That's well, what I'm talking about. Okay, but I would say that the individual selectionists who, 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 who uh, either minimize or, or even deny entirely the role of group selection, many of them do believe we have, in effect, groupish adaptations that facilitate the cohesion of groups it's just that they have a different story as to how our minds got that way. That's right. right. And, That's right. and among the, the ways that can happen, I mean, first, kin selection, they would say, in other words, family level selection, they would say is technically individual selection. And, you know, interestingly, um, you know, similarly, the dynamic they would call reciprocal altruism can lead to, uh, you know, uh, social cohesion beyond yep. the, the family. Yep. Oh, so well, that's true. That's fine. It, it, it's, 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 tough to tease apart. There's also the fact that in in the groups uh, that we were in for uh, most of human evolution, mm -hmm. just about all of it, um, there would have been a high degree of average relatedness within a given, you know, village or whatever. Not, so, not, not nearly as much. First of all, not nearly as much as you would think. There was a recent paper, and I, I think science, uh, Kim Hill as the lead author. Existing hunter-gatherer groups have a much, much lower degree of relatedness than anybody ever realized. Right. But I mean, existing... Uh, I would have to. I should read the paper first. But I mean, there are a lot of existing hunter gather groups that have a uh, a scope and structure that you didn't start seeing until about I don't know fifteen thousand years ago or something. So you know, the so called complex hunter gatherers, say Northwest Coast Indians and things like that. But well, let's. I'm just saying. Uh, right. They, they, right. You can get partway to groupishness with pure individual level selection. Right. 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 That's, so here's what. So as I understand it, you know, I, I had to I read a lot. You can get to groupishness, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I had to read a, you know, a lot of Dawkins, read it very carefully in writing the book. And I really like his formulation about how there are replicators. You know, DNA is the replicator molecule. And then there are vehicles 
that the replicators build and to spread themselves into the next generation. I think that's great. That's very helpful. And I, I fully agree with Dawkins that you can really understand animals and their bodies and behaviors by looking at them as replicators, as, I'm sorry, as vehicles for the replicators. So the crux of the issue is, can a group ever be a vehicle? Right, right. That's the whole debate. And I asked Dawkins this directly. I met him briefly a few months ago. And he and I think he agreed with me that that is the crux of the debate. That is, I think he agreed that he says no, I say yes. Now, I'm not certain I'm right here. But um, now that we understand, so look, the rejection of group selection in the 60s and 70s happened before we knew a lot of stuff about human groupishness. It's before we knew about major transitions in evolutionary history. It's before we knew how incredibly fast genetic evolution is. It's before we knew that there has been war among groups for as far back as we know, tens and tens of thousands of years. It's not a new development. Um, the level of war was very, very high. So most of these guys all say, yes, group selection, multi-level selection is possible in principle, but if we do the math and we look at the variables, it's not likely. But well, all the variables have changed. All the variables are now different and much, much stronger in terms of it working for groups okay. as vehicles. Okay. This leads me to a, to a question I had after watching your TED Talk, which I did at your recommendation. The, um, I, I think you're right that the strongest case for group selection would come in the context of war. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, and if there is a group uh, selected uh, tendency to kind of sacralize the group yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. and almost let the bounds of yourself and self-interest dissolve in the in the course of identifying with the larger cause, the larger group. You know, if there's a natural context for that, it's probably war. OK, exactly. That's, that's right. OK, but your TED talk, when you when you argued, OK, group selection has given us this tendency, this ability to transcend um, ourselves very much celebrated it as a good thing, and yet your argument is saying that it naturally manifests itself in the context of wanting to kill large groups of other people. Yep, right? That's exactly right. That's so, right. so Aren't we an interesting species that this adaptation for binding together in order to compete is what got, you, look, you wrote a whole book on this, you know, on cooperation. Right. We're masters of cooperation. Now, you tried to explain it all using those lower level processes, and you did a good job of it. But I think if you look at the nature of groupishness and our love of sports, I mean, we would not spend so much time and money on sports if we weren't evolved for war. I mean, sports is as close as you can get to war. We enjoy it when evolution, look, this is your language too, when evolution, you know, want, wants us to do something, it makes it fun. Well, I mean, again, I would say at a minimum, we would have to be evolved for coalitional aggression. Yeah, that's right. You know, whether, whether war per se, but, but. Uh, anyway, we certainly are designed for coalitional aggression, I, I think. Um, we, we don't disagree. But, but I'm asking you, I mean, kind of like in terms of spinning, you know, uh, the, the spiritual, I mean, you know, you, it was you were putting a very uplifting spin on it in, in the TED talk. Yes. And yet uh, you, you just said, well, basically, we do this when we want to kill people. And, and earlier you said, look, you can't have loyalty reach the whole planetary level, sorry, can't happen. So that's right. So why should we be as upbeat about this as you were sounding in the TED talk is what right. I want to know. Okay, so I'm arguing that the reason why this is in our genes, or rather the reason why this ability is part of human nature, the ability to lose ourselves, uh, and here I go, you know, basically I'm putting Durkheim and Darwin together on this. Mm -hmm. This ability we have to lose ourselves and suddenly become very groupish and care about our groups, um, I am suggesting that this came about because we have such a long history of war and we are all descended from the winning tribes. We're not descending from the loser tribes. We're descending from the ones that were able to get it together. So war is a big part of why it's in our nature. But groups don't just succeed in battle. They also succeed in trade. They succeed in maintaining social order and cooperation mm -hmm. and trust within the group. Um, they succeed ultimately, as, as one evolutionary psychologist, uh, Leslie Newsom put it, they succeed ultimately by doing a good job of turning resources into children. And that's not all about war. And uh, so it's not that we do this when we want to kill each other. In fact, the point of my TED Talk was, we do this so often. We climb mountains seeking this transcendent experience. I just had lunch with Ron Bailey of Reason Magazine. He was describing a ballet he went to in which he was crying. It was so beautiful. It, these, these so wait, you think that's the same thing? You, that, that comes out of a, gr a group selective affiliative impulse designed for war? That's what's happening when we watch well, ballet? 
well, the ability to shut off the cells. That's what I'm suggesting is a product of group selection. Now, we then use that ability in all kinds of ways, often that are not social, that are not about bonding with others. But the fact that we're able to lose ourselves, that's kind of a weird thing if you're committed to an individual level selection. People are always selfish, or at least they're always after their self-interest indirectly. But, um, but even climbing a mountain, I would think of other things. I would think about the thrill of successfully taking a risk, which you can imagine being not, an adaptation in its own right. right. I would imagine... Right. That's, that's not group selection. I, I, I would imagine, right. And I would imagine the scenery you see from mountain climbing... Right. Being kind of the the natural appeal of certain landscapes, you could you you could explain without groups, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's right. right. That's so, right. so I mean, it seems to me you're you're extending this uh, maybe a little less critically than than I would the the, the, the group selection thing. Well, that's no, that's true. The, the ability to shut this. So so let's let's talk about adaptations here. Um, I think we're all of us in this business of writing about religion from an evolutionary perspective. I think we're all on board with the idea that cognitive features, cognitive traits can evolve for one purpose and then become pre-adaptations used for another purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I'm suggesting here. I'm saying, here's this weird thing about us. We have this ability to lose ourselves. I can't think of anything it's good for. Can you? Well, define lose yourself. I mean, uh, uh, sure, I can think of plenty of times when it would be good for you via individual selection not to be thinking about yourself at all. My dogs are not self-conscious at all. Yeah. They're designed by natural selection. They spend all their time focusing on other things. In fact, I would say self-consciousness is the later evolutionary development in, in that sense than losing yourself in your environment. Right. Okay. So that would be a good account of the flow state, what Mike Chicks at Mihai calls the flow state. Maybe losing track of yourself helps you work more effectively at certain challenges. So if self-transcendent experience was just flow while you're on task, then you would win and I would not have anything to say. But most of these experiences we reach from taking psychedelic drugs, which are often done as part of a group ritual. We reach them from bowing repeatedly. So religions do a lot of things to produce this state of self-loss. And in the process, it binds people together. So one of the really influential things I read was Barbara Ehrenreich's book, um, Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy. That's what really got me on, on this line. Um, and she talks about how, and you know, you probably read this, or uh, um, you know, she talks about how the sort of the you know the primal religious rite is dancing around the campfire to very rhythmic uh, music, and a lot of anthropologists wrote about this. It dissolves hierarchy, it increases trust and love. The effect of this is straight Durkheim. It's to create a community, a congregation that trusts each other. So that's where I, you know, that groups that can do that, they can shut off the self. It's like an off switch for the self. Groups that can do that function better as groups, not as individuals. Um, That's my claim. Okay. The uh, and, and this is an opportunity to clarify part of your argument. I, I think when you say that religion <clears throat> is, you think a group level adaptation. I think you don't mean what a lot of people would would at first glance think you do mean, which is they would think um, you're saying, well, m you know, modern religions are all about the Ten Commandments, telling people not to lie, cheat, and steal. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that religion uh, was uh, is a genetically based adaptation whose function is to control our our uh, our selfishness in in that sense of reinforcing moral strictures. That's that's not what you're saying, right? No, that, that's not quite what I'm saying. So let's let's trace it out. You know, if you look, both of us think sort of you know evolutionarily, which means both biological and cultural. And obviously, you know, the, ad the evolution of God, that's about changes happening so fast in historical time, we're not talking genetic evolution there. Right. So I think in general, there seems to be a lot of consensus that, there, that uh, belief in supernatural entities is a result of this hyperactive agency detection device. Uh, so it can, it can, you can have all kinds of byproducts. This is what D Dawkins and Dennett uh, say, uh, 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 you know, so... Let's suppose that the belief in supernatural entities came about as a byproduct. Now, then there's a couple things you can do with it. You can take the Dawkins line, which is to say, uh, and then you just have these pernicious memes that take advantage of it and hurt us. That's one line. That's kind of a hard line to argue for if you're going to say it hurts us all around the world and has done so for 50,000 years and hasn't gotten weeded out. That's kind of weird. Um, that's one line. The other line, which is taken by Scott A. Tran and Joe Henrik, two anthropologists I really respect, is... At that point, cultural evolution takes over, and 
some societies use their supernatural a agents to create better moral order and trust. And you don't and deny those... that that goes on, right? Oh, and of course that goes on. Okay. Of course, cultural selection and cultural group selection mm -hmm. goes on. Mm -hmm. But here's the piece that I want to inject into that argument, because I want to basically start with the, the Atran and Henrik, uh, yeah, Atran and Henrik argument. Start with that, but then say, now let's add in the new finding that genetic evolution is really, really fast. Uh, most people are committed to saying evolution largely stopped 50,000 years ago because they're, you know, if it, if there's been genetic evolution in 50,000 years, then there could be race differences. Therefore, there has been no genetic evolution. That's what Stephen Jay Gould said. Um, but that's obviously wrong. Darwin knew it was wrong. Animal breeders know it's wrong. Anyone who deals with animals knows you can actually get genetic, you can get behavioral differences by crossbreeding after just a few generations. So now that the Genome Project has showed us that evolution, genetic evolution is very fast, and that, in fact, it sped up during the Holocene. It sped up at least tenfold during the Holocene. So you got these primitive religions 50,000 years ago, people all over the world doing this religious stuff. Does it have any implications for survival? If, as long as it has any implications for survival, you're going to have some degree of genetic evolution going on. That's my argument, that we evolved by gene culture coevolution over the last 50,000 years, and so our, our religions evolved to get more moralistic, especially after agriculture and larger subscale. Well, yeah, but when you talk agriculture, you're not talking anywhere near 50,000 years. No, that's 10,000. That's plenty of time. Look, we now know, what are all those new okay. genes that we're finding? Those are genes that have responded to agriculture. The way, you know, East Asians have special genes to digest rice. Tibetans have special genes to breathe at high altitudes. 10,000 so years. what do you think agriculture in the context of religion, what has the agricultural era left us with? Well, once you go to agriculture, uh, you get much larger group size, you get surplus, you get storage containers, which means it's possible to dot for, for uh, individual elites to dominate wealth. And that's what you see in the archaeological records. Right, I know, but I mean, what biological adaptations are you attributing to that era? Oh, well, so it's gene culture coevolution. Once you have people, hunter-gatherers, let's say, who begin cultivating a little bit, and it grows and it grows, and they now have a surplus, they now have larger group size, um, now, the selective forces in terms of who reproduces uh, change and the selective forces between groups, which groups conquer and kill which groups, or not even kill, just which groups prosper, wiping out the other groups even without violence. Would you agree with me that the selective pressures both within group and across group change? Well, if the social structure changes and if you're, yes. r and if you're right that significant uh, evolution takes place within a given context and the social structure has changed, the adaptation could change. I'm asking you, Thank you. I'm That's asking what you what adaptation, I'm not saying I accept both of those premises, but I'm asking you what adaptations are you suggesting are unique to the agricultural era okay. from well, the beginning five, 10,000 years ago? Right. So of the, of the sort of things we're interested in here about religion and morality, mm -hmm. I would say it's this. What we do know from, uh, I forget the author, it's cited in the chapter there, but what we do know is that once you get agriculture, gods get much more moralistic. The, before then, the gods are weird and capricious, and sure, they're sure. not. Yeah. yeah. But, but, so, the gods, so you're the saying gods, that's in the genes? No, 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 no. No, the gods are changing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once the gods are changing, that's cultural evolution. Right. Once the gods are changing, and now the social structure is changing, and now the reasons why people get ostracized or killed or excluded are changing. Now you've got social selection going on. Chris Bohm, the anthropologist Chris Bohm, has a book coming out in two months. One of the key ideas is social selection, that we humans have been selecting, we've been affecting our genes by who we choose to marry and who we choose to ostracize for a long time. So once the gods change and the social structure changes and the morality changes, it becomes much more binding. Now individuals who have a harder time controlling their impulses are no longer these fearsome warriors who get all the chicks. They're now the criminals, the deviants who get shunned or, cru or crucified or expelled. That's got to have genetic consequences. It goes on for a few so thousand years. So talking about the evolution of greater self-control. Exactly. That's one. That would be one example. So you would, if you're right, then, a group that has remained, a, the, you know, a hunter-gatherer group like the Inuit or some other hunter-gatherer groups, you would expect them to be different in that sense, genetically less prone to self-control. But you, Well, you would have to look at how, what they do for self-control. Now, the Eskimo, uh, they are a very unusual group, and uh, as long as they've been expelling individuals for deviance, uh, for showing anger, as Gene Briggs says, I would expect them to have pretty good self-control. But you got to look at each you got to look at each group. 
That's correct. I would say in principle, it is quite possible that groups that have lived with civilization, agriculture, large-scale societies, laws, and, and uh, punishing gods, groups that have had that for 10,000 years or 3,000 years even, there could be some slight differences. Now, we're not talking any new traits. We're just talking, can you tune up, you know, there, all the features are there. Can you tune up your knobs and dials, as you say? See, if I accepted your premise that, that significant evolution has happened during that period, I might argue it the other way. There are many more opportunities to cheat. In, in, in a large anonymous society, and, and, and the person who pays attention to what these moral, moralistic gods are saying is the sucker, because he or she doesn't take advantage of these opportunities to cheat. Okay, so you might suppose there's been some greater evolution for Machiavellianism. That would be fine with me. And so uh, well, but, I would but imagine... You, okay, but you're positing these differences um, that you could in principle test. Well, I, well... First of all, I'm just positing that they're possible. Secondly, given that we can't find a gene for anything, we're not going to test them by finding that the Inuit have different genes. I mean, nobody can find a gene for height, for how tall you are. Um, so um, I'm not saying we can go out and start doing DNA testing to find moral differences, not at all. Uh, but I am saying that such differences are in principle possible, even though they're morally repugnant. And since the rule is follow the sacredness, since almost all of us are politically liberal, uh, I'm now a centrist, by the way, but since the whole research community is politically liberal, if you sacralize issue, if you, you know, if, if race difference is the worst possible thing, that means that people are going to have a hard time thinking about fast evolution. They're going to reject it on principle because of its implications. But when you do that, you gum up all of our thinking about evolution. If we're simply going to say, no, no evolution in the last 20,000 years because it's politically impalatable, then we can't make progress in understanding ourselves. Well, again, even 20,000. I mean, significant, significant uh, changes in social structure are more recent than that. But anyway, the, yeah. your I emphasis think on... 5,000 years is not... Yeah. That's more like it with agriculture per yeah. se, I think. Yes. Yeah, I think 5,000 is plenty of time. And it varies, you know, I mean, God, the, the, the Laps, the Laplanders, I don't think they ever got to agriculture, did they? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I mean uh, so what I mean is even within race as we think of it, there are huge, there are huge differences. Well, I'm um, sorry. Wait, wait, just by huge, what we mean is tiny but not zero. In the social sciences, that well, what I mean is huge within your framework. If, again, I'm not I'm not even accepting the the premise, but but uh, but if you accept the premise that five thousand years uh, is this is the span during which there's going to be some significant change, I mean huge rel relative to to that. So in other words, no, within, within what we think of as a race, um, uh, Caucasians, it's not like agriculture reached them all at nearly the same uh, time within those 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. That's right. So here's so two points to make. The first is variation in personality on any trait is so vast within any group, any ethnic group. Um, so if there are what, you, what, what you're calling race differences, if there are group differences, they are likely to be tiny compared to the variation within groups. So I would never say huge differences. Secondly, I don't think it's very useful to talk about race because a race is the, you know, the three major continental groups. And there aren't really selection pressures that apply to the three major, con you know, it's not as though all Africans or all Europeans face something or other. But for example, rice farming, there's now a lot of really cool research on rice farming. The Han Chinese, the people who dominate Asia are the Han Chinese because they're the ones in Asia that figured out how to farm rice. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no such thing as a family rice farm. You can't just go out and plant rice. The only way to farm rice is by getting hundreds of people to cooperate in creating irrigation zones and, and dividing up water. And so the argument that some people are beginning to make is that, um, uh, can you hear me? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. I think a, a, an external hard drive is crashing, but let's not let that bother us. It's not related okay. to this taping, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, but if you have, if you have people in, in, in uh, China um, working together to farm rice, for a couple thousand years, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly cooperative. And just imagine the social selection there. Imagine who gets shunned and who is a very eligible person to marry. Um, that's a set of selection pressures that is very directly related to, to who has children. Um, it also obviously is hugely, it, this is what their cultural evolution is all about. And you're gonna get Confucianism and you're gonna get personality traits that can fit within a Confucian framework. Compare that to a herding or, or uh, uh, you know, you know in, in the areas of Greece or, the, or other parts of the Middle East, um, compare that to a, you know, a steppe civilization. 
where you've got to be tough as hell in order to guard your flock. Um, if that goes on, so which are the men that, uh, that succeed and which are the men that get killed? As long as you've got selection pressures going for a few millennia, there can be very slight differences. And so, for example, um, what are some of the serotonin genes that are, you know, what's the, the, the short allele of the serotonin transporter gene? Um, it seems to be a, you know, it causes all kinds of problems in Europeans. It makes them more vulnerable to mental illness. But most East Asians have it. How could that be? Well, it confers greater social sensitivity. That's the sort of, that's the sort of gene culture coevolution that I think there's now some evidence for. That gene, just out of curiosity, has that observed downside in the Chinese population and the upside? I don't know about that. I know this is the original one of the genes that uh, Caspi and uh, Moffitt uh, wrote about in their science article a number of years ago. And I saw a talk by Shelley Taylor, a uh, social psychologist, showing that if you look at the graph carefully, um, the people who have that gene and have good, good childhoods without a lot of instability, they thrive in America. Um, but uh, the people who had the, uh, the, long, you know, the long allele uh, and had uh, poor social uh, childhoods with a lot of instability, they, you know, they did, wait, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact story, except the point is that if you have the short allele and a very stable childhood, you actually do quite well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quickly, I think we've been, we, we're, we, we're running out of time, but quickly, just to get back to what I thought you were going to say when I, when I asked you for the, exactly the sense in which religion, um, uh, some of the components of religion seem to be group level adaptations. Um, and you did, I guess you did kind of touch on this, really, but, but you're, you're hypothesizing that the binding effect of ritual, group ritual, like these dances and so on, Evolved in a, in a context of religion, and I guess I'm wondering um, if that's the case. First of all, why is it so easily separable from a religious context? Um, you know, uh, we we most often see it at football games now. And also, uh, I'm curious, how is the data in terms of even uh, the anthropological data in terms of how often in hunter gatherer societies it, it's in a very explicitly religious context that you see? I think you don't always see these rituals in a certainly not in a theistic context. Right. That's right. Well, because I, I don't think of religion as being like Christianity and Judaism and Islam. I think of religiosity. Our religious minds evolved so that if we uh, sacralize something together and then circle around it, often literally physically circle around it, um, if we do that together. We trust each other and we have something sacred. That's what I mean by sort of natural default basic human religiosity. So look at fraternities. I would say a fraternity is a religious community by that definition. They have all kinds of initiation rites. They have sacred objects. They have taboo words. Um, right. They sacralize them and then they can really cooperate. Um, I went to Burning Man in 2009. You know, there's both a temple and then there's the man. And when you burn them, it, it adds the central devotional rite. Uh, and there is a, there's an ethos that goes along with it. Burners can trust each other. They can work together. They have this amazing community with no money and just about no crime. Um, uh, and what do you do after it burns? You literally circle around it. So this is religion. This is religiosity. But I guess that's, I guess that's what I'm kind of saying is you're calling some things we don't – in America, when we say somebody saying, wait, you can't burn an American flag, we don't think of that as religion. We think of it as patriotism. And yet you're saying that is religion. Yeah, exactly. So, so, that's why it keeps – that's why I keep saying politics is religion. Okay, fine. Okay. But, but then you're defining, when, when you say religion is a group level adaptation, you're not talking about the main things people associate with religion, which is belief in supernatural beings, you know, and so on. Oh, well, the belief in supernatural beings, okay, yeah. So uh, if you want, we can make a di distinction between theistic religion and secular religion. And if fraternity is going to be a secular religion, the nation is a secular religion, and Christianity is a theistic religion. I'm fine with that. As a psychologist, you know, whether or not there are supernatural entities is relevant, but it's not most of the story. And this is my fundamental disagreement with the new atheists. They focus on belief in gods. And since, you know, they think, and you and I think that those beliefs are false beliefs, uh, they then leave it at that. The religion is wrong. They, I, I'm a Durkheimian. Religion is not fundamentally about belief in God. It is fundamentally about binding groups together around sacred values and objects. A God is very, very useful in doing that. But you can do it around a flag. You can do it around a beer keg if it's the sacred beer keg passed down from the first Delta Epsilon Phi brothers or whatever it is that they do there. I don't know. Um, we just have a tendency to do this. So, you know, look, we can bind around Martin Luther King. 
Uh, we can bind around Joan of Arc. Uh, we can bind around the Bible. Um, I personally, when I was in Westminster Abbey and I saw uh, where Charles Darwin is, is buried and there's the, you know, on the, they, you have the stones on the floor mm -hmm. and people are walking right over his grave. And I'm like, get off, put, put a rope around this. You know, I, wor I worship Darwin. I, I mean, in a sense, I worship Darwin. I, it bothered me to see people walking over his name. I, I'm not certain the body's right under that spot, but I thought it was. And I was bothered by that. That's religion. Okay, I mean, but that's a definitional question. I'm not sure I would call it religion. That's, and and well, it's, not, it's not what most people mean by religion. Okay, most but most people think patriotism is not religion, that it's different. So you're using... It's not very different. It's only a little bit different. Well, that's your argument. I, yeah. Well, I mean, it's an, it, it's an empirical question. See, I would agree that it's, it's drawing on uh, some of the parts of the brain that comparable religious rituals draw on. I, I, what I what I mean I'm, is, I, I think know, when I'm, you say religion is a group level adaptation, most people, including many academics, will think you're saying something different from what you're actually saying. Okay. Well, so again, uh, something that I really I try to keep clear, although I don't always do a good job of it, is the difference between the sort of the underlying psychological foundation and the network of meanings and traditions that we humans build up in cultural evolution. So religion is obviously a cultural construction. Religion can't be in our genes. But these cultural constructions that have similar form all around the world and in fraternities and in patriotism, these, these social constructions are only possible because we have this mental architecture that I'm describing in the book. Mm -hmm. And that is the ability to circle around a sacred object with a group of people. And once we've circled around it, we then trust each other and can work together. That's what I'm talking about by the foundation, the psychological foundation of religion. And I'm saying this is part of moral psychology. Moral psychology is the foundation of politics and religion. Okay, well, by that definition, we are all religious. Exactly, exactly. So, so most people are, are confused who think they're not religious in your view. Right, psychopaths uh, are accepted, uh, right. but the rest of us, if you hold anything sacred, um, and you feel that you're part of a community that fights for good against evil, it's going to be activating the same mental systems. That, that yeah, is... I, I agree there must be some overlap. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, so we've gone longer than we should have, but it's because this stuff is so interesting. Again, the book is a, is, is a book whose title you'll have to trust me on since you can't see it. It's The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Thank you, John. Continue good luck with uh, with the book. Okay, thanks so much, Bob. And uh, uh, viewers can go to RighteousMind.com to see the cover and uh, reviews and videos and all sorts of other stuff. Thanks a lot. We will have links to that. Okay, thanks. thanks.